So the lesson for the day is going to be an, intro, an introduction, excuse me, to titration, what it is and how to get this done. Okay, so let's get started. So a few things we need to be able to do is to read the proper volume of a burette. A burette is an important piece of instrument, instrumental glassware that's used to do titrations. So I have here a ring stand with a double burette clamp with a burette in here. This little thing down here that you turn to let the liquid through is called the stopcock. And when you read the volume of the liquid, you're going to have to look very, very carefully at the lines. You read it from the top down, not the bottom up. So this would not be 15.123, 15.45. Instead, you'd read this from the top down, 14.12345. It's a little bit past, read from the bottom here. So maybe 14.55 milliliters would be an accurate volume for that. So it is 14.55 milliliters. The volume on the burette goes to the tenth of a milliliter, which means your measurement needs to be recorded to the hundredth of a milliliter. Please remember that you always estimate one digit of uncertainty in all measurements. All right, so if we were to look at this one, let's see what we think that volume is. Any guesses? Go ahead, think what you're gonna say. Remember to have it to the right number of decimals. So I heard somebody yell out 24.55. I don't think that's quite right. We don't read from the bottom. It's not 24.123455 5, because we don't read from the bottom. We fill it up and we drain it from the bottom so it goes from the top down. So instead, a better measurement might be 23.1234, 23.4, and, and then I estimate the last digit, 23.45 milliliters would be a good measurement for that. All right, let's keep going. Now you notice if we added more lines there, it's going to be a little bit more precise. Ours only go to the tenth, so I'm not gonna to be too worried about that measurement. So let's define titration for you. It's an analytical method. That means you're gonna do something in the lab in which a standard solution, that's one that you know its concentration, is going to be used to determine the concentration of an unknown. In other words, you know how much of one thing you add, and then you're going to have to figure out then and assume that however much you add of that one, it will be equivalent to the number of moles of whatever you're trying to titrate or figure out its concentration. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use what's called the equivalence point or the end point. It's really a, the equivalence point is sort of a theoretical point, and we're going to define it at the point at which in solution, if you're doing an acid-based titration, you have equal amounts of hydronium ion and hydroxide ion in your solution. And how will we know when we reach that point? Well, that will be determined by a color change using an indicator. So we can see we have a little flask here. We're adding a liquid to it, a, a liquid that we're trying to, to, we know its concentration of, into one that we don't know. And initially it's colorless and we add that up and shake it up and it stays colorless. We add a little bit more. We can start to see some pink color. We give it a little shake. And if that pink color stays, we've reached the end point. It's gone from colorless to clear and that color change stays. So we add our known material until the point at which the color changes and stays. And we stop at that point. It'll be a very dramatic change in the pH causing that color change. So if we look at this graph here, we're looking at pH versus milliliters of base added. So initially, the solution would have been very acidic, so it has a low pH, and we add base, and we add base, and we add base, and the pH doesn't change very much because the acid is able to neutralize all of the, the base. When we get to about this point, it's sort of like you're, you, you're on the edge of, of a, a balance beam and you're about to fall off, but you haven't yet fallen off. 
And then what happens is the wind blows and blows you off. Well, in this case, we add one more drop of base to our acid and it shoots the pH from a point where we're way down here all the way up to here. That's just one drop difference going from here to here. Now, we don't add any more base at that point, and we assume we're basically, no pun intended, in the middle of that graph at pH 7 at the equivalence point. That's how we get the equivalence point when it changes colors. And again, it would have been colorless to pink at this point. Okay. Now, technically, that indicator would not be the right one for this, but it'll be a rapid color change, which is all you need to know at this point. So when we are at the point of equivalence, we assume that the number of moles of acid is equivalent to the moles of base. If you know, for instance, the molarity of your base and the volume of the base, then you can figure out how many, the, and you know the volume of the acid, you can figure out the molarity of your acid. Now, the N is a new variable that I'm introducing. It has to do with the number of proton ions or base ions that you would get. For example, in HCl, HCl produces only one proton, so N would be one. However, if I were to use, say, sulfuric acid, when it dissociates, it makes two protons, so N would be two for sulfuric acid. We'll spend more time on the N variable when we get to the calculations, which will be the next video that you'll need to watch. Well, let's try this example problem here. So we've pretended we've done the titration and these are the results that we've gotten. So it says it took 42.5 milliliters of a 1.3 molar potassium hydroxide base was required to neutralize 50 mils of sulfuric acid. So our task is to find the molarity of the sulfuric acid. So here's what we're gonna do. Let's make sure we understand how we got this data. We started with 50 mils of sulfuric acid, but we did not know what its concentration was. I then put in my burette some 1.3 molar potassium hydroxide. I added an indicator to know when the endpoint was going to be reached. I added then my potassium hydroxide drop by drop by drop until I got a rapid color change in my solution. Once that had occurred, I stopped adding the base, and I would be at its endpoint. How much base did I add? Well, according to this problem, 42.5 milliliters. So let's do a little bit of tabulation here. For the acid, that's a sulfuric acid. The molarity is what I'm looking for. The volume was 50 mils that I started with. What would be the value of N for sulfuric acid? good. You said it would be a 2 because it donates two protons. So far, so good. Now let's look at the KOH. So specifically the hydroxide is what I'm interested in. Do I know the molarity? Yes, 1.3 molar. Do I know its volume? Yes, 42.5 milliliters. Now as long as the volumes are in the same units, we don't have to worry. You don't have to worry about converting it to liters. The units will take care of themselves. What is the N value for KOH? You're right, it's one, because KOH, when it dissociates, makes one K, one plus, and one OH, one minus. Now I have everything written down, I can do my formula, MV number, that's N, MV number, for the acid equal to the base. I'll go ahead and plug in my values, molarity of the acid times volume times N, equals molarity of the base times volume of the base times N. And I solve it, and I get my answer. The molarity of my sulfuric acid must have been 0 0.55 molar. Hope that makes sense to you. We'll try to do a little bit more here to help you understand this concept. So when I'm doing a titration, I have a known concentration and that's going to be what I put my standard solution in the burette. My unknown is going to be added to, let's say, an Erlenmeyer flask so I can swirl it. I'm going to add just a very small amount, a drop or two, of my indicator 
into my unknown concentration. I'm then going to add my base until I get the color change to take place. And at that point, I stop adding and record the volume. One thing sometimes we have to do is make a calibration curve to see how accurately we're working with our materials. So notice what I've done here. I start with a certain amount of acid uh, in the burette, and that says zero mils, and I drop the volume down to one milliliter. So I would have added one milliliter into my Erlenmeyer flask. And then I would titrate it and figure out how much base. Then I don't need to fill up my burette to zero again. If I start from one and I add to two, I added one milliliter my second time. And then I titrate that. Then I continue to add acid. I start from two and I go to four. So I added two mils and then I titrate that. Then I go from four mils to nine mils and I've added five. Then nine to 17, I've added eight. The key here is I don't have to fill the burette up to zero each time. I simply need to record where I ended the last time and, and the difference between those two points will get me my values. So I take a certain amount of acid, a small amount, figure out how much base it needs, and I make a dot on my graph. I add more acid, figure out how much base, and I make a dot there, and here, and here, and here, and here. Now, theoretically, those points will be a nice straight line going through the point zero, zero. Next, I take some unknown um, acid and I put it on there, figure out the amount of base it takes, and I plot that and I can read off the concentration from my graph. It's maybe easier for me to explain this with a burette and kind of demonstrate this to you, um, but these are the basics of what calibration curve are. Getting back to the titration curves, I mentioned that the indicator you use is going to be dependent on if you have a strong acid, a strong base, a weak acid, or a weak base. If we use a weak acid, like acetic acid, and a strong base, you will want a, a, an indicator that changes the pH at around 9. Phenolphthalein works nicely as your indicator. Because what happens is, Acetic acid is a weak acid, and as soon as you add the smallest amount of strong base, the pH starts to go up somewhat steeply here until we get to this point where we're right about on the, on the uh, end point. Almost all the acid's been added. We add one more drop of base, and the pH shoots up very dramatically. And so if we were to go the middle between these two points, it's at pH 9, not pH 7. So if we're looking at this graph here, the pH indicator then is going to change color to indicate uh, a rapid pH change. So phenolphthalein is colorless when it's in an acid and turns pink in a base. So for this example, uh, looking at it, pH 7 might be a nice endpoint. Now I have a sort of a weird analogy here. I think of it sort of like a pirate walking the plank. And when the pirate walks off the plank and falls into the water, the shark eats it and the water turns red. That represents from the shark's perspective, here you are on the top of the piece of wood. And as you fall into the water, you're falling down, even though it looks like you're going up, the water turns pink. I know it's a silly analogy. It's what I use in my class. There's my little pirate, right? Telling you to walk the plank. So it changes from colorless when it drops rapidly into the color change, it turns pink, okay? And that would be the end point. All right, not really happy with that example, so let's try another one here. Uh, I'm going to skip that slide here, speed this thing up a little bit. Um, if we look at a strong acid, let's say hydrochloric acid with a strong base, the equivalence point will be around pH 7. Okay. So we're looking at a strong base, strong acid. And what that titration is going to look like is something like this. It's going to be very straight, not sloping up. And then at a certain point, it's going to shoot up. And notice the end point here, the equivalence point, 
is right at pH 7. That's what you're looking for with a strong acid, strong base, like sodium hydroxide, sodium chloride. The indicator you'd use with this would be something like bromothymol blue. It will be yellow in an acidic environment and blue in a basic environment. Most of the time, students are capable of getting to stop right about the green color, that transition, and they would be very close to a pH of 7 if they tested that with pH paper. Let's compare that now to, well, here we're looking at actual data, I guess. So we're looking at the pH when we add a certain amount of acid. So when we add 10 mils of acid, the pH very, very, barely changes. We add another 10 mils, it barely changes. Add another two mils, doesn't change much. We add two more mils, doesn't change much. We add three mils and it changes quite a bit. And another mil, it shoots up. So we're looking at the gradual addition of base to our strong acid. The pH doesn't change very much, doesn't change very much. The color stays yellow. And then as soon as we add one more drop of base, pew, the pH shoots way up here and now it has turned blue. That's when we know to stop adding and then we can get the equivalence point, okay? Let's keep looking here. As I mentioned, if you're using a strong acid, strong base, we wanna have brome thymol blue as the indicator as it changes in the range of around seven. Uh, let's see here. We're looking at here if we were to do different indicators. Uh, you would not use all these different indicators, but they all change at a different point. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide. That's not too interesting. Now, if we were to titrate a weak acid with a strong base, understand that before with a strong acid and a strong base, this line would not have curved up. Instead, it would have had a gentle slope up and then shot up much later. So this is the typical curve that we get from a weak acid, strong base. It's going to have a, a slope up right from the beginning. That's how you can tell the difference. And because it reaches the equivalence point at a pH of around 9, we're going to use a different indicator, such as phenolphthalein. That would be the best indicator if you're trying to titrate a weak acid with a strong base. If you were to take a weak base and titrate it with a strong acid, we get a graph that would look something like this. And now you notice that the equivalence point is not at 9, it's not at 7, it's down here maybe around 5. So if that's what you're going to titrate, you'll use a different indicator. Again, you do not choose an indicator because you like a certain color. You choose the indicator that best shows the color change at the equivalence point for the system you're studying. Let's do one quick calculation here. Let's figure out the concentration, the molarity of HCl. And let's assume that we mix up a standard solution and it's a two molar sodium hydroxide solution. And this is a strong base and a strong acid. So which indicator should I be using? Good, I think I heard you say bromothymol blue. Now, what it says is it took 30 milliliters of the standard base to neutralize or titrate our hydrochloric acid that we were using. So I guess we're going to restate this. It's going to take 10 and a half mils of acid to titrate 30 mils of two molar sodium hydroxide. The other way to say that was we started with 30 mils of two molar base and it required 10 and a half mils of acid to reach the end point. You can say it either way, I suppose. So our purpose is to find the concentration of the HCl. So what did we do? Well, we started with our burette, then we took our little flask, and in there we had our base, 30 mils of sodium hydroxide base that I knew the concentration of. In this case, it was two molar. I added my bromothymol blue. In base, it's going to start blue. And then I filled my burette with acid. Didn't know the concentration. Now I'm going to add a little bit of acid and as I add that acid what happens is the indicator changes color and I add that indicator until it just turns yellow from blue to yellow. 
the volume that required was 10 and a half mils. That will be the end point or the equivalence point. At, theoretically, I would have an equal number of moles of both acid and base at this point. Next, I can do my calculation. MVN equal MVN. Now, I left the N off because HCl has just one H+, plus and NaOH has just one OH. So to simplify it, I simply wrote molarity of the acid times volume of the acid equals molarity of the base times volume of the base. I can now, and, and more importantly, when I say the acid, it's the H plus concentration, and the base, it's the OH concentration. So the HCl, let's think about this. The HCl took basically one-third the concentration of the base. So therefore, the base must be more or less concentrated. Well, it must be more concentrated. So about how many times more concentrated? Three times more concentrated. Very good. So what would that make its concentration? Well, if the base is two, approximately six molarity. Now, I know it says more concentrated. Uh, that's an error. It's three times more concentrated. But if the concentration is two, it'll be approximately six molar. That's our guess. Well, let's plug in some numbers. What is the molarity of the acid times 10.5 milliliters of the acid equal the molarity of the base times the volume of the base? Plugging in the numbers, I get 5.7 molar for the unknown concentration of my acid. That's how titration is done. Its purpose, again, is to determine the concentration of an unknown by comparing it to the concentration of a known. I hope that makes sense. I'll review with you some titration calculations in a future uh, presentation. And for now, I'll say good day.